Alrighty, 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 alrighty. Um, well, what's up everyone? Lance Hedrick here, and we are live in my newly freshly painted and drywalled studio. I'm excited to hang out with you for the next, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, but yes, I hope you have something tasty that you've brewed that you're going to be drinking while we do this live stream. But um, let's see how this goes. Already getting loads of um, comments and chats. Let's see. Shout out to your friends in Korea. It's 2 a.m. here. Thank you for watching. 2 a.m. Awesome. Very, very awesome. Uh, let's see. What about doing a live unboxing first impressions together with Ugo on the sculptors? Well, if he's here when they arrive, I don't think he will be here when they arrive. Um, let's see. What brewer would you recommend for someone who currently uses a Chemex and really only brews one cup, two cups max? Well, if you're really into that conical kind of profile, which gives you a gradient of extraction, I would definitely recommend something like the V60 or uh, the Flower Dripper or something along those lines. I think they do a really nice job and they're very easy to kind of um, to, to, to begin using as you move away from the Chemex. Um, let's see. Just tuning in. Thank you. Um, unless it's over to the left, you could set stereo. Can you set any to audio to mono? Um, I'm really not sure how any of this works, just to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm scared to mess with anything out of fear of losing it all. So maybe uh, left ear is just what it's going to have to be, um, sadly. 1 a.m. in Shanghai. Awesome. Wow, there's a lot more going on here than I was expecting. All right. Um, Anyway, I just want to say, before we even really continue on, I want to say thank you so much for all the support. Over 10 million views, mind-blowing. I hit that milestone like a week ago. Over 150,000 subscribers, another one I hit about a week ago. And we're at over 100 videos, and we're just two years in. The two-year anniversary was March 19th. And so thank you so much. I'm humbled and happy and grateful, and it's just incredible. Um, I'm currently sipping on some of the new... Pepe Hijon from uh, Manhattan. There's not a label yet because it's not for sale yet. But Ben is in the chat and said that for people in this chat, if you're wanting to order some, he will put on a little pre-release for you. So check that out. Um, not sponsored or anything. I just, this is my favorite coffee of 2022. And uh, I just got this bag in and told him I was going to brew it. And he said, well, I'll release it early for the people viewing. And I was like, all right, bet. Um, very cool. So will there be a review of the Caf Messino? So I had the Caf Messino, which is, uh, it's actually a, a machine you can buy on AliExpress, the base machine is, for like 250 bucks or something. It's a very cheap machine, but it's actually, it seems to be pretty well made, at least the little time I had with it. I did not have time to actually go through and do a review of it. They uh, asked for it back before I was able to do that, uh, which is kind of a bummer, but uh, it is what it is. Whenever I borrow machines, I tend to ask for at least six months with the machine uh, because I don't know when I'm going to be able to get around to reviewing something. And they kind of wanted it back after three months. And during that three month period, I was traveling a lot. So I, I sadly wasn't able to get around to doing a full out review, but you know, it is, it is what it is. Um, tampers with patterns on the base waffle spiral. Do they do anything? I don't think they really do anything. I think they're just, you know, marketing, a marketing ploy. Um, I'm not I'm not really a fan of, you know, some of the gimmicks. So I, I, there's been absolutely nothing to show that, they're, that they do anything other than anecdotal evidence of people saying, my shots are now better. Who knows? Uh, thanks for all the love on the new studio. It, you know, it's the same studio. I just had drywall put up, had it painted white. Because doing all of this uh, work in here late at night was uh, it was pretty difficult. With all the black tile, it just felt kind of like a dungeon. And so I, I, I thought a, a change was nice. And having it, uh, this white color, I thought would just be a really good feel for me. So, all right. Let's see. Uh, anything about the new Pietro grinders? So um, I've been very open about this, but I am a part of the Pietro release. I helped, I helped with, uh, sorry, my kid's outside screaming with my wife. I helped with uh, uh, the burr set, the pro brewing burr set. Uh, and so I'm really proud of that burr set. I think it makes incredible coffee. Uh, uh, before I make a review of this, I'm wanting them to send me the base that I helped create as well. Uh, for me, this wasn't ergonomic enough to really um, 
uh, uh, really to justify the price and the use of it. And so I, I was pushing them and pushing them to create a base. And so we came together, made a base for it so that it's more stable. Now you can hold it and do this, of course. But if you're going down to espresso fineness, it's pretty it's pretty difficult to kind of grind that. So, um, but yeah, so this is going to be a, a fantastic grinder. I've had I've blind I've had people blind taste it alongside the ZP6, and sometimes with the fellow Ode with SSP burrs. And every single time I've presented these uh, cups without any labels to people, they all gravitate well, without question to the Pietro uh, with the with the Pro Brew burrs. Now. Again, I am part of this, and I do get a kickback for every time one of these units with the Pro Brew Burrs are sold. So I am biased there, but I they, they were not going to release the Burrs until I was finished with them. So yes, I'm biased, but it's it's. I mean, I literally created the Burrs, right? So they are. I mean, it's it's um, it's uh, it it wasn't one of these situations where a company said, hey. Can you can we get your stamp of approval on this and then market it? No, I've never done that and I will never do that. I have to have a lot of tangible uh, effects on the final product for me to publicly announce any type of uh, any type of uh, um, collaboration, any type of collaborative effort. So. With this, I did create those uh, brew burrs inside. They are the most unimodal on the market out of any hand grinder. I have uh, tested this on a Master Sizer 3000. Yes, they beat out the ZP6. Um, but yeah, they're 58 millimeter blind burrs. Uh, they do a great job. Um, yeah, so we can we can take a quick look at the burrs, actually. Um, they got coffee all over it, but you got the burrs there. They're blind, and you have a lot of nice cutting surface area on it. Um, but yeah, so... That's the Pietro. That is, uh, we've covered that. Good. Um, Midnight in Indonesia. Wow. Incredible. Um, let's see. Hi, Lance. Appreciate your efforts. Oh, no. Where'd it go? There's so many comments. I'm really, I'm really going to try hard to get through a lot of these. I don't want to just look at my screen the whole time, though. I feel like that's, like, not good energy. Um, so I'm just going to kind of skip around, actually, because I don't know where that one went. Are we doing enough for farmers in specialty? Can we be more ethical? How do we decide what is the most ethical way to source coffee? I think they deserve more coffee profit. I'm so glad you brought this up. This is not something I've yet touched on my channel. I'm waiting to get my permit all figured out here in Portugal before I travel to Origin. I'm planning on doing some videos at Origin, so be looking, uh, be on the lookout for that. Um, I've already talked with some producers uh, and some people to travel with in order to get some really nice content to kind of give you a more under a, a broader understanding of kind of the dynamics, economics at play. Now the question is, are we doing enough in specialty? No, specialty is not doing enough. Just because someone claims to be specialty, just because someone is buying coffee that's technically specialty doesn't really mean that much. What I always tell people to do is be sure that whatever coffee you are buying, you ask the roaster what they paid for it, okay? Now, this is this is a, a, a thing about transparency. Someone can buy a, a coffee over 80 and it be considered specialty, but it could only be 10% more expensive than commodity. So it doesn't, like, just because someone labels themselves as specialty isn't enough, and we need to expect more out of our importers and out of our roasters. And the only real way, in my opinion, to do that, or not the only way, but a credible way, in my opinion, is to ask what roasters, what importers are paying for their green coffee. All of this secrecy, all of this behind closed doors is not okay. And you, the consumer, you are the ones who have the most power in order to make a change. Stop settling for buying from a roaster if they're not willing to be transparent with you. You must be able to ask, what are you paying for this green? And if they're willing to tell you, I think that is a big step in the right direction. There's something called the transparency pledge that you can all kind of uh, look up after the stream or right now, I'll pull up another tab or whatever. But this is a pledge that was started. Uh, the inception was with someone doing a thesis at Emory out down in Atlanta. And a lot of, um, they reach out to a lot of specialty roasters, importers and things like that in order to come together and create a pledge on, on, on transparency in general. And I'm not gonna, you know, I won't sit here and waste too much time. Or it wouldn't be a waste, I don't think, but I won't spend too much time here because I highly, highly encourage you to go read that. But there are some notable people who signed it. Like I know, obviously Onyx, uh, where I work we were one of the first people to sign it but Tim Wendelbo signed it and a lot of other a lot of other inc incredible roasters that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with have signed this pledge to always be transparent with all these um with all these dealings so no we're not doing enough and until everyone is transparent and aren't trying to be trying to pr practice shady business practices in order to profit off the backs of these farmers who are making the coffee that we're drinking uh, I, I don't think that we're, we're we're quite there and so uh the, the the power the ball is in your court as consumers so um 
yes, especially you all that work at multi-roaster shops. This is something that I, uh, a friend of mine, JJ, told me is he asks FOB of every roaster that they work with, which is, I never heard of that. That's fantastic. Anyway, we'll move on. Let's see. The best budget grinder for a newbie. It really depends on a lot of different things. So when I talk about grinders, budget grinders, uh, and recommendations in general, I ask a lot of questions. I ask, are you espresso focused or filter focused? What is your budget? What is kind of your, do you have a specific aesthetic preference? These are things to kind of take into account. Now I'm gonna name just a few budget grinders that I kind of enjoy. Um, but, oh, and then the other thing I guess I would ask is, are you uh, against hand grinding or not? So here's a, here's a big thing. When you think about the construction of a grinder, where, where, when you have a manual grinder versus an electronic grinder, let's say both of them cost $300. You're thinking a $300 hand grinder, that's absurd. Well, think about this. The, let's say the cost, to, uh, the, they both have the same profit margin, okay? Let's say they both have the same profit margin. Let's say it's 100 bucks each. I'm just throwing out random numbers. This has nothing to do with my experience with grinders. I'm just throwing out random numbers. They both have $100 that they're, that they're wanting to profit. So they have $200 to construct their item. On the one hand, with electronic uh, grinders, you have to get the motor, you have to get the gearbox, you have to get all of these different things aligned in order to work in a specific way to handle the torque automatically. Whereas in a hand grinder, they can spend more time on higher quality parts, precision, alignment in factory. And this is why I'm such a big believer in buying affixed cones onto their axle instead of floating burrs. I just, I think that's a waste. So if you're not uh, averse to hand grinders, they're going to give you higher quality at a similar price point as electronic. Granted, some of that there is there is you know uh, diminishing returns that happens there. So I always first recommend the Easy Presso Q2 Heptagonal, the Time More C3, uh, the King Grinder K4 or K6 when they're on sale. All those are right around 100 US dollars, and those are going to beat out everything at 100 dollars in electronic grinders, and most everything at 200 dollars. I think the Opus at 199 and the Bratza Encore ESP at 199 are both incredible options at that budget tier but you're going to get a little bit more granularity if you're going towards maybe the easy presso x pro which is at 150 uh, and, and some of these hand grinders can get you a little bit more control though it is a little bit of effort but i'm, I'm excited about some of the uh the new the new products that are coming out that are a lot cheaper uh which which has been fantastic and i've covered a lot of them in recent videos let's see Huh. Hi, Barista for two years. Been learning your latte art stuff since I started. Getting better with ripples. Game changer, but not able to get uh, is being able to hold a hot cup from the bottom. So, well, then I would ask, uh, you know, are you preheating your cups? If so, then that might be, that might be, you know, the issue there. But, you know, I, I think people should be preheating cups on top of their, on top of the machines. If it's too hot from the milk, you might be steaming your milk a little too hot. Otherwise, the sad answer is you just need to kind of develop barista hands. At some point, you know, when you're steaming milk, kind of holding it and pushing pushing the capability of your hands, that's something that tends to happen over time. And that's really the only, I mean, I mean, obviously you could hold the handle, which I actually push for most baristas to do. Um, and I say that, I, where did it go? There it is. Now I say this because oftentimes baristas aren't capable of holding the cup all the way at the bottom like this. And if you're holding it like this, your fingers are where people put their lips, which is kind of gross. So I would actually recommend holding the handle um, if, if your fingers can fit. With a lot of cups, my fat fingers don't fit, but when they can, I like to hold the handle in order to just stay away from the lip as much as possible. Um, Otherwise, you need to kind of hold it like this really daintily. If you're palming it, your fingers are at that lip, and that's gross for the customer. So I don't I don't usually recommend holding from the bottom, but it, it is what it is, I guess. Let's see. Um, ben, where are you at? People are asking for the release, uh, the link. I'm going to scroll through to try to catch up. Um, difference between the K-plus grinder and the ZP6 on the final cup of filter brewed. Flavor, body, aftertaste, overall. So K-plus versus ZP6. This is a great question. So the ZP6 has a very specific grinder, and of course I'm gonna pull these out. You said K plus, so we'll pull out the K plus. Um, so, what you have with both of these are two completely different sets of burrs. Um, and, oh, I'm tightening it, I need to loosen it. So, with the ZP6, you have something that actually looks similar to like the Etzinger burr sets, uh, which I think is quite unique. Um, and then with the, let me get this off. 
with the K plus, you have something that resembles uh, what, what people, you know, are, have called the the C40 style bar, the Commandante style bar. Granted, I'm not sure Commandante was the first one with that, but I don't really know the history behind that. I just know there's no there's no patent on that to my knowledge, um, and so a lot of people kind of have similar uh, designs to that. But here we go. So we have. We have these two burrs here. We have one with much, much more aggressive dips down and a faster, uh, a faster feed rate, which is actually kind of shocking. Normally, you would think that a faster feed rate would create more fines, but um, what what you have here is also a very small finishing teeth section. Whereas on this one, you have cuts all the way up these sides where you're feeding the beans. Now, people have asked me a lot to kind of explain bird geometry. Now, a lot of bird geometry is kind of voodoo, but what I can tell you is feed rate can kind of be seen based off of the apertures surrounding the burr. Now, I'm, I said earlier that it has a faster feed rate. That's not necessarily true because the, it comes out more here. It doesn't have as deep of grooves inwards as something like this does. Now, I know you can't really see this super well. I don't have Hugo here to be my cameraman, so we're kind of just we're kind of just rocking it. But this one has deeper grooves, um, so it's going to have a, a little harsher uh, break rate, and this is all speculation, a little harsher break rate than this one, which is a, a thinner slit, but it's more aggressive. And it just has these single cut lines all along the top. Top, whereas this one on each ridge has multiple small cut marks. So how does that translate to the cup? Because that's obviously what matters, right? So translating that to the cup is a little difficult, but I will try my best. So what you have with both of these, I'm just going to move them out of the way. I'll reassemble later because these grounds on the table, on this beautiful white table is uh, frustrating me. So we got that out of the way. Boom. Onto the floor. I'll clean that later. All right. So with the K+, plus, the K-series, that type of burr, it's also in the King Grinder K6, similar in the Comandante and the Easy Presso Q2, just a little smaller. You get a really nice, vibrant, punchy cup, but you can get, you, you hit a ceiling with, uh, with, with extraction pretty early. Not necessarily the extraction potential, but more so you're going to hit a ceiling where astringency and bitterness is going to begin, is going to begin to come into the picture. So with the, with the, with the K series, it's incredible, but it is, it's more of a hybrid burr, meaning it does dark roast and light roast both pretty well. ZP6 is a much more unimodal style grinder. And I'm saying this objectively because I've run this through tests but it is a more unimodal style grinder, mostly meaning that the peak, so the ideal, the, the particle size that you're kind of choosing with your grind size is much more narrow, meaning there's more particles at your given grind size than a, a separate burr. So the K-series burr, the Comandante, all of these have a wider peak, meaning you might be set at, you might be trying to hit a diameter of 700 microns, uh, but what's really is going to happen is the majority of your grounds are sitting between like 620 and 810, something like that. Uh, just kind of like random numbers, right? But the, the peak is much more wide. Whereas on the ZP6, they may be sitting more so between 680 and 720, right? So you're going to get a more unimodal uh, type of curve with the ZP6. And now speculatively, this would translate to a cleaner cup uh, because you're kind of getting a more even extraction through the grounds. Obviously, if you have a ton of smaller particles and a ton of bigger particles, those are going to extract at different rates. Whereas if you can keep them all to a similar size, you'll get maybe a more even extraction and you'll be able to push your extraction higher without hitting hitting uh, that wall of astringency, okay? So that's kind of the, the big differences there. Let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Dad problems, that's right. Um, uh, what do you think of the flare grinder? I've liked it except for the thumb rest that hurts my thumb to use and the silicone sleeve that travels, especially with finer grinds. So I've not been a big fan of the flare grinder, to be honest with you. Um, it was something that I actually decided not even to review. I didn't see uh, I didn't see much hype kind of behind it. And so uh, just to kind of explain my approach to reviews, if you're kind of curious why the majority of my re reviews are positive, it's because I have very strict rules on how I review and no better time to uh, address that than here right now. So whenever I'm reviewing a product or, or thinking about reviewing a product, I ask myself a few questions. First, um, do I like it? If I like it, then I want to review it because it's something I like and I want people to know about it. If I don't like it, then I ask myself a few questions. Does it have hype behind it? If it is a highly hyped product and I do not like it, I will review it and give it a negative review or, or, you know, not necessarily negative review, but I'll point out the flaws, you know, and, and make sure that people kind of understand maybe it's not do the hype, or at least I don't think it might be do the hype. The next thing that I ask myself, okay, maybe it doesn't have a lot of hype, 
but are they dishonest in their marketing? And if they're dishonest in their marketing, I'm going to review it and I'm going to call that out, which I've done with a couple of products as well. I try to not focus on giving bad reviews to products if they don't hit either of these marks. And it's because there's no reason to trash a company if no one's really buying the product anyway. That, that, that's kind of that's kind of my my view on it. I I always am in uh, uh, I'm, I'm always on the team of of you all. You are my number one uh, concern, and that's why I've actually burnt some bridges by giving not stellar reviews um, to some of some products um, it, it, with companies that even have given me a special treatment, like posting a review early. And then with that early treatment, I didn't post an incredible review and kind of you know. Uh, I don't have, I, sometimes people become not Lance fans. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's the kind of long and short of it. So when I approach reviews, I do that. And, and when it comes to uh, people loaning me equipment, I always tell them, here's the deal. You can loan it. I am not signing anything. I am not going to be paid for this. Um, and I'm allowed to say anything I want. And you're not going to know what I'm saying. And sometimes people say, well, never mind. We, we you know, we want to know. We want you to send me the review first. We want to make sure that, you know, yada, yada, yada. I do not play that game. So if, uh, when, when I am uh, loan machines, that is just straight up in the air, like, what I say is what I say on camera and there's nothing they can do about it. So I want you to know I am always in your camp. I know that y'all aren't really questioning that, but uh, I just I just uh, have been meaning to address it. Let's see. Good evening from Greece. I want to ask how in Italy um, they use 14 gram dose and specialty coffee 19 or bigger. Why this increase in dose? So in Italy, you have a, it's hard to compare specialty and typical Italian coffees. They're two completely different worlds. In Italy, you have a, a massive, uh, massively Robusta. Most of them are 100% Robusta or a heavy blend uh, featuring Robusta. And Robusta is a, a bigger bean than Arabica, which Arabica is kind of the, the, the species of beans that typically make up specialty. There are now specialty Robusta and some other species as well, but Arabica is by and far the majority of what you're drinking in the specialty coffee world. It's what typically scores those higher marks in order to be co uh, considered specialty. When it comes to Robusta, they have about 50% uh, more caffeine, which caffeine is bitter. If you were to buy powdered caffeine online and taste it, it's incredibly bitter. So it, it, it increases the bitterness of the coffee. It is much more uh, typically dark roasted, and which gives you a much more uh, th thick espresso like very thick like almost waxy thick uh crema i mean i said espresso but the espresso is thick as well so what you have in italy is you have uh very darkly roasted robusta heavy blends that uh that are going for a very specific flavor profile which is just bitter chocolate and maybe some like burnt caramels right so there's not really much going on as far as nuance in italian espresso which is absolutely fine and i'm not against that in fact you know i've tried to find some darker roasted coffees that i've enjoyed um i just i'm not a big fan of that massive heavy mouthfeel that like sits on your tongue for hours because the, the bitterness kind of just really gets to me i'm not i'm just not a big fan of that but they do these 14 gram doses because that's more so of a, a, a um that's more so a Seven and fourteen has just more so been their tradition there. I guess it's not they. It wasn't approached with an idea be, of of um, extraction th uh, theory or extraction dynamics. Whereas when it, when you get into specialty, the base. Uh, what, this would be speculation, but. There's been a push for this 19 to 21 gram shot, and I think a lot of the reason is for a more a, a bigger shot of espresso for an actual drink. But on top of that, because these coffees tend to be roasted lighter, they get lost in milk. You can have a 20 gram shot of Robusta, and it's not getting lost in milk. You can toss, you know, 250 grams of milk in there, and you're going to taste the coffee first and foremost. With lighter roasted coffees, more dainty, uh, non-robusta coffees, they can get lost in a lot of milk. So you typically want a bigger shot. But also, there's been some, uh, there's been a, a lot of work in recent years that kind of show uh, the, the 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 connection between a deeper bed and and how that plays its role in extraction. I'll do some of that in a video in the future, so we won't go, we won't we won't really dive into that deeply right now. But another thing to consider is baskets just used to be smaller. Uh, especially throughout Italy, there has been a push to the 58 millimeter group head. But for years, and a lot of my levers, I'm, I'm looking over here because I have a lot of lever machines from uh, way back in the day, uh, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you have uh, very commonly uh, 14 gram baskets that are very uh, like 49 millimeter, 51 millimeter, 46 millimeter even that are just really deep hold 14, 15 grams. So a lot of that is also just tradition. Ita Italy, Italian co coffee culture, very, very heavy on tradition. So Let's see. Um, someone said something about 
their girlfriend says my hair is looking great. They have curls or something, and I like that. Thank you. Um, let's see. Will, will Breville release the Lance Hedrick dual boiler? I freaking love that thing. Would 100% buy it. I would love for that to happen. Just so, so we're clear here, um, a Breville reached out to me uh, after I made a video on the Breville dual boiler. No affiliation with Breville when I made this. Um, uh, they reached out to me. They liked this video and they were like, hey, all of those modifications that you discussed, we should make that a reality and, and reveal it as like a custom car type thing like they do at car shows at the next SCA Expo. So I worked with them in creating this. I was not paid to do this. This was not, I didn't even get to keep the machine. This was more of a fun concept thing that they were just wanting to do. They did this once before in like 2012 or something. They put a rotary vane pump in a Breville dual boiler just to kind of show that they could. And this was another one of those concept car things where maybe it will become material, maybe it won't. I'm I'm hopeful it will become material, but I don't know. I, I have no idea. Um, maybe if everyone here emails them that's interested, maybe it will kind of push that forward. I don't know. It worked with Easy Press on the ZP6. I also don't work with them. And everyone emailed them from the video I made on that. And they did a special release. Um, I saw no money from it, but, you know, is what it is. There have been, you know, there have been some fun accusations that I work with them. But uh, the fact of the matter is I have not even received a daggum dime uh, from them, which is fine. I wouldn't have anyway because I don't want to be biased. All right. Um, let's see. Let's see. Your last video on baskets was very helpful. Do you find there is difference between the standard baskets, e.g. currently using an IMS competition? Does it make sense to try VST or Pullman? So I have found that I personally prefer the Pullman basket over the VST and IMS. I think the difference between Pullman and VST is the same difference between VST and IMS. But the difference between a Pullman and IMS, I think, is quite, is quite uh, not big, but it is more noticeable. I think more people would notice the difference between those two. I have preferred the Pullman to the to the competition IMS personally. Um, and when you throw a paper in the bottom of the Pullman, you're almost at those levels of the two hundred dollar baskets. So for home enthusiasts that uh, don't mind, you know, prepping their basket with a paper filter, I think you're about as good as you can get without spending 200 bucks uh, using a Pullman with a paper filter. Granted, the IMS and the VST with paper filters are also fantastic. So I don't think there's really a need to run and buy a new basket. I'm not pushing for that right now. That's not the narrative I'm weaving. I'm saying that you can get incredible results without having to spend all that money. Just toss in a paper filter on the bottom. Good to go. All right. All right. Let's see. How do you dial in water for coffee um, using Lotus for each coffee? So a big thing that I've been trying to push is knowledge on water chemistry. So I actually co-founded a company called Lotus Coffee Products, Lotus Coffee Water, that looks like, here, I'll pick them up in a second, um, that look like this. So we've got these little vials with minerals inside. So I co-founded this about uh, a little over a year ago with Nick Chapman. Um, and so... What this is, what this product is, it is a, it, they are concentrates of minerals. So we have bicarbonates and we have your essentially general hardness. All right. So right now we have four options. We have two bicarbs, two general hardness. Now you're asking, well, what does that mean? So with general hardness, this is this is t talking more so about the calcium and magnesium in your water. Um, so I, I know that Chris Hendon has done some work on the role of cations in coffee extraction. I would kind of push back and, and, and say... I don't, I don't think, and I'm about to release a video on this, I don't think that uh, these cations or the, or the bicarbonates actually affect extraction. Hot topic. I don't think it actually affects extraction. I think it's, it, it affects flavor. So essentially, you can brew with distilled water and add minerals afterwards and have the same effect as if you were to be brewing with those minerals in the water prior to brewing. Okay? So with bicarbonates, that is your buffer. So we have potassium bicarbonate, and we have sodium bicarbonate, and both of them buffer because the, the HCO3. But both of them can impart a dip, slightly different flavor based on whether you have sodium, which some people say lowers bitterness, uh, kind of like adding salt to uh, sodium chloride to your coffee, like James Hoffman has a video on. That can reduce bitterness. So some people believe that sodium bicarbonate can reduce bitterness in your coffee. Then potassium bicarbonate, some have said it can be a little brighter. It can add to the, like the brightness and the fun floral, uh, bright character of a coffee. Then on general hardness, 
which this just more so affects the flavor profile, the creaminess, the mouthfeel, etc. You have magnesium chloride and calcium chloride. Oftentimes people use magnesium sulfate or like third wave water uses citrates. Um, we, we opt for chlorides because we find them to be uh, tastier than the sulfate. Sulfates uh, I've found to bring kind of a harsh taste to the coffee. And then citrates kind of turn into citric acid when brewing. We may end up, you know, offering a citrate as an option bottle to buy if you're wanting to do that. But it, it turns into like citric acid, uh, at least from my conversations with Dr. Smirke. That's that can that kind of is what happens whenever it's heated up and added into all of this uh, craziness that happens in extraction. So. Anyway, that's kind of what I'm doing with Lotus. Each drop is a certain PPM for a kettle. So every kettle of water you make, or like if you get the meticulous and every time you add water to it, or even if you just have an espresso machine that you add water to, you can build your water based off of your flavor preferences. So how do I mix my Lotus before every brew? It's very simple. I try to emulate the roaster's water profile as well as I can. I, I Ideally, I want to be able to list out the water uh, chemistry, the water, um, the the what the water uh, chemistry is of all of these roasters that I enjoy and that you enjoy, and make a big Excel sheet or something that people can search and replicate the water of all these roasters. Because what a, a massive lack lacuna in the home brewing world is knowledge on water. Now, of course, you have the nerdy subreddits, you have the the EAF Discord, you have these different areas where people do know a lot about water. But the general public don't really know much about water and they still use tap water. Then they think that's fine or they use, you know, lightly filtered water, which is better than tap unless you're in an area that has incredible tap water. But for the majority of people in the world, the water that you're getting from your tap is probably not making your coffee taste very good. And considering a, a, a filter cup of coffee, let me take a sip. Filter cup of coffee is over 98% water. It is very important what you use. In an espresso, it's about 90% water. So it's very important. You definitely want to get rid of the chlorine and any other off flavors in your water. But it, the most important parts are the calciums, the magnesium, the um, bicarbonates, your so your sodiums, your uh, potassiums, things like that. So I will either reach out to the roaster and see if they know their water content, or I will ask them, where are you getting your water from? If it's from the city or whatever it might be, or well water. And then I will ask what uh, cartridges they might be using to introduce or take away any types of minerals. And then I'll try to make a good assumption based off of the information they give me to replicate their water. Because when you think about it, roasters are roasting to their water necessarily. People can act like they're not, but that's just not true. When you roast and you cup, you're cupping and making tweaks based off of the water that you brewed your coffee with right? So if someone is brewing their coffee with 150 ppm, you have like 80 parts per million of this, you have like 60 parts per million of this, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. That's what you are t making your coffee taste the best with. Now let's imagine you have someone in N N Manhattan where, where uh, tap water in multiple places is 40 ppm, one fourth of what the roaster is using. Perhaps that coffee is not going to taste good at all on their water. And they're not thinking about this. Most people aren't thinking about it. And some people will just commit to one specific water profile. Like a very popular one is the Barista Hustle or the Rayo Perger water. It's very common that people will do. But even that, having a one shoe fits all, one size fits all is not adequate because roasters roast to different waters all over the world. So my one of my big goals is to be able to provide to everyone the water chemistry, but it's going to take $100 or $200 um, commitment from these roasters to provide us exactly what they have. And then we, we can recreate it with the essential minerals that we make at Lotus Water, and you'll be able to recreate anyone's uh, water. So that's kind of the uh, long, long, uh, long answer for that. Let's see. Um, hi, Lance. Awesome channel. I have an Oscar II espresso machine. Nice. I think it has 15 bar of pressure. Is that too much? If so, why is it so highly reviewed? So um, that is that is too much. Uh, you essentially have, and this is still speculation. There's no real proof of this, but there are people who have attempted to prove it. But you have what, what some people refer to as secondary puck compression. That happens around 11 bar of pressure. Um, 10 to 11, it depends on who you ask. But uh, essentially, you have a full compression that will occur um, when you're riding up uh, your the, the bar of pressure. And then it kind of flatlines. And then you have a secondary compression that can occur that can like choke your puck or cause a lot of channeling. I apologize if you can hear the air airplane overhead. Hopefully it's not loud enough for that. I live close to the airport. Um, but 
Um, the 15 bar is much too high of pressure and can cause a lot of channeling or choking. Um, and, and it just is not ideal. It's, it's just pumping way too hard and pelting that puck. I would recommend changing the OPV, which should not be very difficult. Uh, Simonelli, uh, it's typically pretty easy. I've not actually changed the OPV on an Oscar II, uh, but I guarantee you there's a YouTube video for it, or at the very worst, you can email them and their customer service does a fine job of responding. So I would, I would lower it to about eight or nine bar of pressure personally, um, but yeah. Let's see. Uh, what are your thoughts on heavily processed coffees like the double thermic shot, koji, comb fermentation fruits uh, with fruits? Would you consider it cheating to achieve unique flavor and do you enjoy it? This is a big question and I'm glad it's asked. It's asked every time I do anything public. Um, I'm always asked this question and I'm fine answering it. All right. All right. So my thoughts on alternative, I just call it alternative processed coffees. I personally rarely enjoy the flavor of alternative processed coffees. Um, I just, I, I don't. They do seem very artificial to me. It seems like you're adding artificial flavoring to something. And it's because honestly, a lot of times you are. But I think that um, there's a lot of ways of looking at this, but I think um, whew, this is such a hot button topic. It's kind of difficult to discuss. I am all for innovation that can allow higher scores for producers in order to raise the amount they can charge for their coffees. So that's the short answer. If there is an innovation that a producer can implement on their farm in order to achieve a higher green score so that they get more money per pound or per kilo for their coffee, I am all for it. I do have fears that as the market yearns for more and more of these styles of coffees, and farmers that aren't backed by uh, deep-pocketed uh, roasters or importers, I'm fearful that people will try this, fail, and then their crop can't sell at all. Now, I don't know how big of a fear that is. It's just something that plays around in my head. I'm sure it's not that big, but it is a potentiality that I would be a little wary of. Also, the fact that I don't like them makes me biased in looking at the negative side of things. I just haven't really enjoyed very many coffees with these alternative processing methods. That being said, they are growing in popularity. And if the barista competitions have anything to say about any of this, that is the way that the specialty coffee world is wanting to be seen, I would assume, because this is how kind of these competitions are being marked by as these funky types of coffees that don't taste anything like coffee. I am kind of a, a, annoyingly, I, I guess, a, a purist when it comes to coffees. I prefer more, um, uh, not even really a purist, because that sounds, I don't, I don't like that term. But I, I really appreciate a nice, sweet, complex, floral style washed coffee. And so for me, I, I just enjoy nice sweetness, nice uh, complexity, florality. Uh, and it, then my fruits, I don't want them to be boozy. I don't want them to be overripe. I like them to be ripened. I like them to be sweet and, and you know, juicy. Um, but a lot of these other, other coffees, they bring in just a whole slew of other tastes, which is great. And honestly, what, what it's a great, what, what, what a big upside are things like Koji can be incredibly sustainable uh, and can be, and can really make coffees score higher in areas that might not have the best environment, especially with environmental changes that are going on. It, it could be, it could be a helpful thing to really push a lot of research and, and minds and money into this type of, uh, into these types of processing methods, because in areas that maybe historically have had incredible environments and weather for the growth of coffee, maybe it's changing and people who have generational farms aren't able to make the same scores that they were used to. And now maybe they're, 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 what the prices they're fetching at auction or uh, from buyers is going down. And if it, all they have to do is add some sort of uh, funky yeast strain or some sort of inoculation to their process in order to increase their per pound cost, it's hard for me to say no to that, right? Will I drink those coffees? Probably not. I'll probably be looking towards the people who are making you know, these washed coffees. But this is still the early phases of it. And I'm confident that as time goes on, there are gonna be, there's gonna be so many broad steps in this area that it will, I'm sure we'll be able to recreate a really nice coffee that I enjoy in an area that historically can't grow those types of coffees because they don't have the altitude, they don't have the weather, the environment, the cloud cover, the shade, the soil, etc. Maybe they can recreate it with some sort of alternative process. And I'm all for that. For me, I want my, my biggest things personally is I want to make sure that the producer is being paid sufficiently, which is just not happening. There are very few uh, roasters and importers that are actually really making a push to push equity down the 
chain. Uh, and that's why I say always ask your roaster what they're paying. Make sure that they are open because we have the power as consumers. Um, but the other big thing for me is obviously taste. And, and if something tastes like the coffee I want it to taste like, and it has like some sort of triple anaerobic, um, you know, XYZ yeast added inoculative process with Koji on the last 12 hours, Cascara frozen, hung in the river to dry process. If it tastes good, I don't really care. It's just thus far with all the trends I've been seeing, they're all, they all tend to be vinegary or um, like high in acetic acid. They tend to have like a really boozy type of thing going on. Oftentimes you'll get um, a lot of uh, defects from these overly intensive fermentation processes. Um, and, and, and so I've, I'm not, I've not been a fan, but I just wanna make absolutely clear to everyone watching, if there is a way we can we can use this and we can have people come together with the with the means in order to make this a more accessible approach to revolutionize how some farms are able to grow and sell their coffees, I I am all for it. I just don't like the taste. <laughs> all right, I think that is sufficient. Um, all right, thank you to people who are sending money. I am like seeing that there's like money popping up, and I am. I didn't even know that was a thing. Thank you very much. I see Stan Sprinkle did one and I'm very thankful for that. Thank you. Um, are you coming to the Amsterdam Coffee Festival on April 1st? Pretty please. Great question. This will have no longevity because once this video is posted and people watch it in a year, they're gonna be like, this means nothing to me. But I'm on the fence. I'm hoping to be able to go. We will see. I think tomorrow I will be able to know for sure if I'm gonna be able to go or not. We will find out soon though. Um, Yes, the coffee I'm drinking is from Manhattan. Ben Morrow is the roaster there. He and Esther Mastum, his partner, uh, run the company. And this is from Finca, uh, Finca Solidad in Ecuador. It is. It was my favorite coffee of 2022. That and the Esmeralda Gesha from Coffee Collective were my two favorite coffees of 2022. This is the fresh crop from my boy Pepe down in Ecuador. He is such a cool dude. Check him out. Uh, Fica Solidad. He's an awesome producer. Uh, but this is the Tipica Mejorada, and it's a Thai Oxy process. Um, anyway, it's great. It's a really good coffee. It has lots of orange fruits. Um, you get like a lot of orange tropical fruits, like some some papaya, but you also get like some blood orange. You get uh, a lot of sweetness, a lot of, uh, you, you even get some like nice florality, like orange blossom uh, that kind of goes on. But um, yeah. And I think he was saying he'd post a link or something so people can order the coffee that are in this stream early. They haven't released it yet, which is why my bag has no label, but it's very good. All right, let's see. Um... I'm a big fan of dark roast coffee. I dislike acidity in my coffee, and I feel like this limits my options greatly. Does anyone have any good roaster suggestions? Okay, so first of all, uh, this is, this is um, I'm really glad that you asked this question. I personally don't enjoy dark roasted coffees, especially when, when you get into the territory where oils have been released onto the surface. I don't like those. But I have absolutely no problem with people that uh, in enjoy those. In fact, I pushed Onyx to uh, release widely our Eclipse blend, which is a darker roasted coffee publicly. We did it just for local accounts in Arkansas, but now we, we ship everywhere. And it's because I think it's, I think it's important that big roasters offer, especially roasters, people offer a well-sourced dark roasted coffee. Oftentimes in the specialty world where people are actually paying a lot of money for green coffee, in, in certain, we've already talked about this, so I won't go into it again. But with these roasters that we can, uh, you know, trust more so than others, I think it's important to offer a dark roasted option because what you're telling consumers who like dark roast is, well, you're just gonna have to go buy, you know, some sort of dark roast commodity coffee and you can't control where your money goes. You want this certain thing, we're not gonna offer it for you. I, I wish more would offer a dark roasted option. And I don't think it's from any type of snobbery. I think it's from a passion that these specialty roasters have of serving only things they like, which is absolutely understandable. But I like for there to be these dark roasted options. Now, what I do wanna address is your co comment on acidity. Let's let's be sure we're very particular on our phrasing. So. Dark roasted coffee has just as much acidity as lightly roasted coffee. It's true. It's perceived acidity that you're not liking. You don't like the perceived acidity that you're getting in lightly roasted coffees. They can come off as a bit more sour, which is absolutely understandable. And 
in darker roasted coffees, you are getting just as much acidity. It's just being covered. It's not being perceived in the same way. Now, this is something that uh, Morton um, at Coffee Mind Academy has has shown uh, through many, many, uh, many different um, lectures. You can find these on YouTube. But he shows that in a lightly roasted Kenya versus a darkly roasted Brazil, there is more acidity in that dark roasted Brazil. Not because it was darkly roasted, but because inherently that coffee had more acidity. So... Let's just keep in mind that, you know, if you're having uh, th these issues where you're like, I, I want less acidity, let let's be sure to be careful in uh, less perceived acidity. There could be a lightly roasted coffee that you really enjoy that just has a low perceived acidity. Anyway, I would, I, I always, you know, if you're in the U.S., I'm biased. I work for Onyx. Uh, but Onyx, the, our Eclipse blend, is a really nice darkly roasted coffee. Um, all right. Let's see. <laughs> All right. Um, is the Linea Micro worth it coming from Amara X? So I'm about to review the Mara X, and I guess you'll have to find out. But this will come down to, it's not going to be a black and white response. Nothing in coffee is black and white. And if I make it seem that way, it's because I'm a passionate individual, and I'm always right. But I like to think so. And so I, I tend to be very strong in opinions and make things to be more black and white than they are. Obviously, I like black and white. I went from a black studio um, to a white one. So, um, oh, is something going on with the stream? I think we're good. I think we're good. A lot of people just dropped off all of a sudden. Oh, well, no worries. Um, look like, yeah, freeze. Yep, that's what happened. I thought it. Okay, I hope. Are we good now? Stream all good. Okay, thank goodness. All right. Um, what was I saying? We were talking about... Um, oh, the stream is going in and out. Why is it doing this to me? Okay, sorry. I can't remember where, what question I was about to answer. Um, let's see. YouTube keeps kicking you out. Well, come on, YouTube. You're making me m very sad. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, this is really sad. I'm really sorry about how laggy it's being. Let's see. Open widget. Let's see suggestions. How can I change the bit rate? I'm going to try to change the bit rate while I'm filming. I don't know if that's going to work or not, but we're going to try. Oh, no, I can't change it. Okay. Huh. Oh, here we are. Yes, I can. Let's go to... All right. Okay. Oh, someone said don't do that. Too late, I did it. I did this. I did it in OBS. Yes, Justin. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, that's why I was saying the 450 to 100. Uh, it, <clears throat> I think, yeah, it's really weird. Oh, well, maybe people will come back. We'll see. Ooh, it's down to like 50 people. 42. Yikes. Oh, well. Um, uh, yeah, I changed the bit rate. Hopefully, it'll be a little easier now. It says we have excellent connection. All right. Sorry about that. Um, all right. It got a tad jittery, but it's okay overall. Okay. Have you been to Santa Barbara? Yes, I have, and I visited Dune uh, when I was out there. It was it was very fun, very nice. Um, yeah, I don't know why this. Uh... Oh well, we'll do this for something. We'll be over here all week. <laughs> I'm so sorry about the long responses. Um, I do have someone here. Is the vi are you? Do you have it pulled up? Is it working okay? Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, so we should be good. All right. Congratulations on achieving this milestone. My question, looking at a new grinder for filter and occasional espresso. Encore ESP good enough or worth spending double on the DF64? So the big thing here is the DF64, you're not going to have customer service and uh, there there are hit or miss issues with it. Um, now, what the heck? It says I have no viewers right now. Negative 80. I think it's just, uh, it's just messing up because I don't have negative 80 viewers. Um, that's very odd. Um, okay. So... 
Uh, the Encore ESP, you're going to have a robust customer service um, sector, I guess, and uh, and it's going to and it's more than good enough for Espresso with those fine tuning settings. The issue is that pour over, you have pretty big steps, so you're not going to get the granularity you'll get with a DF64. If you're doing occasional Espresso, I might push you towards the Opus, even though the Espresso dialing in is a little funky. You can more easily dial in if you're not doing it super often. Um, so that's that's worth looking into. Um, but the DF64 is solid and you can grow into it but again it depends on how uh, you know if you're a tinkerer by nature um, I do like my DF64 though it does a great job um, all right I am based out of Portugal yes someone asked if I was in the US I moved last June to Portugal so I'm currently in Porto DF64 V looks like a dream to me what do you think I'm excited to try it out I'm curious if it will be any better than the time or sculptor 064 um, or 064 s which I should get by Monday but I have a V on the way as well let's see um, I can't get back on it the live stream ends ended for me it seems oh well, maybe that's what's happening it's like ending for people that's very odd well now I'm at negative 16 viewers so we're moving up from negative 80 that's pretty nice um, let's see Let's see, just recently acquired a Diddy KR804 from a friend and was curious about the 80 millimeter burnt options. Do you plan on making a comparison video for the 80 millimeter available right now? Go check out my EG1 video. I have like a 10 minute section where I just talk about all the 80 millimeter burrs. Um, let's see. Lance Man, say I want to increase my coffee water ratio. Does adding more water to my brew and removing coffee from my brew produce the same result? Does it change whether it's espresso or filter? I'm not... I'm not sure exactly what you're meaning, but I would not change both at the same time. I would either add more coffee and keep the water constant or add more water and keep the coffee constant. So I would just change the ratio like that. So if you're doing 30 grams of coffee to 480 grams of water, I would do 30 to 510. That's moving you up to one to 17. Or I would do 29 to 480, you know, something like that. Um, uh, yes, so, oh, thank you, Ronald. Congrats on two years, thank you so much. Um, What's your recommendation for an espresso scale that fits in the Flare 58 dray, drip tray? So I know that the, uh, the Akaya Lunar is the obvious one, but that's a very expensive one. There are, uh, I th the Time More Nano fits, and then I think the Wakako small scale fits. Um, I'm not sure where mine is right now, or I would show you it, but it might be a little too long. It will definitely fit if you take the drip thing out. It will definitely fit there um, as far as narrow goes, but it's kind of long, so I'm not quite sure on that front. Um, favorite European roasters? Currently, I, I drink a lot of uh, Tim Wendelbo, Coffee Collective, Manhattan, Nomad. Um, um, honestly, those are kind of the, the uh, big ones I drink. Um, those are, those are ones I kind of turn to the most, I guess. Um, some of that's because I have great relationships with them. Some of it's because they uh, get from farms that I really like and they're easy to get. Um, shipping's easy. Um, but yeah, those are those are kind of the kind of, I guess, I guess go-tos, yeah. Um, I don't really like to say favorites, but yeah. Um, do you think an EasyPresso K Ultra beats the DF64 on stock burrs for espresso? Yes, K Ultra, K Ultra versus the Italian Milk. Well, for me and my preferences, I think you can get a brighter, more punchy espresso out of the K Plus. The DF64 with the Italian Milk though produce a very rich, creamy, velvety espresso, um, similar to like a, a niche. I think it's actually a, a more traditional uh, coffee than the niche is providing even. Um, fellow scale review win when they send me one, I would love one. Um, or I'll, I'll buy one when they come out. Um, let's see. How do I make pure overs taste less bitter, and more sweet? Also, what roast do I pick for more sweet brews? So the pure over, I've not been a big fan of. Um, I love the idea of being able to use glass as your filter, uh, and using just the puck as your filter, but I've never been able to get a non-gritty, bittery tasting cup of coffee from the pure over, just to be honest. Maybe if you cut out a filter and put it there, that might help get you a less bitter cup. But for the most part, what's happening is these micro particles are making it through because those little holes are just not going to stop it. The puck itself, it's like secondary filtration. It should not really be primary filtration. So you're going to you're gonna get that bitterness. Um, for sweet brews, I'm, I'm always recommending medium to medium light types of coffees. Maybe something that's like a, a cleaner natural. And when I say cleaner, I just mean less boozy and fermenty. Um, or something that's like a washed uh, Central American coffee would be really nice or South American. Um, 
Can you recommend a good grind, a grind setting for Easy Presso ZP6 V60 light roast? I personally sit around five, five and a half. It's a bit coarse, but I like to um, you know make a make a decent amount of agitation and pour with an agitative pour. Um, let's see. Um, I'm a fan of the British Columbia Canada roasters. Oh, nice. Yeah, BC is cool. Uh, I work with Epoch a lot. E P O C H. They do a good job. Um, oh, pour over, not pure over. Sorry. Um, well, I don't remember the question now. I apologize. My mind goes kind of everywhere. Uh, what is your favorite grinder for espresso currently? I personally, it's a hard question because I have so many cool grinders uh, that I get to work with, but I, I am a big, big, big fan of the EG1, Weber EG1 with the core burrs. It's very expensive, so I'm going to give another one. Um, I also really enjoy the Zerno grinder with the 64 millimeter high uniformity burrs for espresso. has been really, really nice. Um, I also really enjoy the, um, let's see, I'm going to go, I'm going to keep going down cheaper and cheaper. So we went with really premium. We went with like mid tier. Now we're going to cheaper. I like the DF64 with the HU and with the MP burrs. Um, and honestly the Atalmar burrs do a good job. I have enjoyed, uh, been enjoying, uh, hand grinding with the, um, I like the Kinu and the J Max from Easy Presso. I think all those are great options. Um, someone said some other $200 baskets. Let's see. Highlands, appreciate your efforts. Great work. Do you think that coffee enthusiasts are going audiophile? The latest madness there is a discussion on how hard drives are affecting audio. So, not no, I just think that highly passionate people tend to find each other. And I think that there are, I think there's a crossover between the coffee world and the audiophile world. Um, I've definitely seen a lot of that, a lot, um, like a lot of it. But I don't necessarily think there's an intrinsic connection beyond uh, the type of people that tend to upset other. And there are crossover, uh, you know, culturally, socially, um, things like that. And so, I, you know, th it may just be that people are kind of gravitating. I've also seen a subset of people really obsessed with vaping and with coffee. I don't know. Um, I don't necessarily think that there's ne like, I don't, I, I, maybe there is people uh, that are traversing over to audiophile because they're finding other passionate people in these coffee forums. But I don't think there's something inherent there other than people are being pulled over to this passion because the person they're talking to brings up, you know, their, what do they got? Moon drop earbuds or something and talking about the treble in the bass and all these different things. Um, so yeah. What do you think about the Mara X with flow control and what is the most common espresso profile with it? I'm filming right when Ugo gets back. So hold, hold, hold your horses. If you're watching this in the future, the Mara X video is on my channel. You can just uh, YouTube my name uh, with Mara X. Um, what's your thoughts on the Lego Mini with updates to the gearbox and with Moonshine Burst for Espresso? You know, unpopular opinion, but in the little in the little bit of comparison that I've done, I've actually preferred the Obsidian Burrs, which they no longer carry. I think the Moonshine's cool. I think they're good. Um, I, I, I wasn't, I just was, I don't know. Um, as far as the updated gearbox, I think that's good. I had someone send me a picture yesterday um, where they've had their Lego Mini for six months and their gearbox, uh, one of the gears was pulverized into dust and it wasn't catching anymore. So the motor would run, but it wasn't catching the axle, uh, which is obviously massively problematic. Oh, super choppy audio. Crud! I am so sorry about all this. I don't know why it's being like this. It says I have an excellent connection. Well, that's just... Sad. Yeah, I'll upload the, rec the recorded version for sure. Ah! Time War C3 good enough for espresso? Yes, it absolutely is. And we'll answer just, oh, wow, th Vince and Repeat, thank you so much. Are there any coffee machines that are as good as the x -Flume? I don't think there are as regards what the x -Flume does. So, again, I made a video on this and was fully transparent about my involvement with them. But to, to say it again, I consulted early on for x -Flume without any intention of being public about that. I was just going to consult and then be done. If I consult on a project, I don't review it unless we come to an agreement where I'm an advisor or um, something like that where it would make sense for me to go public about it. But uh, to abstain from bias, I don't review things that I uh, privately consult on. Just so that, you know, there's no bias, um, no perceived bias. Um, so with the X-Bloom, I, I think that what it does, nothing else is really is really rivaling it right now. Uh, single cut pour overs, uh, especially when it comes to full automation, there's just, there's nothing else like that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would say no. Let's see. Uh, What's your favorite onyx bean for espresso? I've gone through 20 pounds of tropical weather in the past six months. Wow, nice. Uh, if we like tropical weather, um, then you're liking, you know, the brighter fruit, your kind of stuff. I would, I really love the Monarch. 
like that scratches my itch for a traditional profile without going too dark. It hits like dark chocolate molasses, but it also gives you kind of some whiny characteristics about it. And it gives you really, if, especially if you drink it like eight to 10 days off roast, you still have a really creamy mouthfeel. You get those, oh, it's, it's very nice. Now I'm salivating. I have, uh, I have a couple boxes on my shelf, but they're sadly empty. What's your favorite Onyx? Oh, I just literally just answered that. Um, let's see. Was the link dropped to buy the coffee beans he's drinking? Go to Manhattan's website. Maybe they've uploaded it for you there. Ben said he was going to do that. So, um, yeah, people are saying if anyone's experiencing lagging, go out and refresh your YouTube page and come back. Maybe that will help. Um, okay, what is the next best scale that costs less than the Akaya? Well, I've enjoyed the dye fluid uh, scale, which I have right here. But I've heard that there are battery issues, like they die. Uh, not low battery life, that, that is accurate. But for me, just plugging it in every few days isn't a big deal. I know for some people that's annoying because the Akaya lasts for years, but um, I've heard that the battery actually dies, you need to like replace it. So I, I've not experienced that yet, but I've also, I have like 12 scales and so I kind of use them all. Um, but yeah, this, this has been doing a good job thus far. I've not had that issue, but I've read that online. So maybe do some searches for that because I don't want to recommend something and it not be, um, you know, like a tank. Um, the Time War does an okay job. I'm not a huge fan, but a lot of people seem to really love the Time War scale. Um, the, uh, the Brewista actually is pretty dang solid. I know it's like not very pretty, but I love the feeling of the buttons on it. And it's, it's pretty solid. Uh, it's pretty solid. Do I like salmon? I love salmon. I eat a ridiculous amount of salmon sashimi. Um, you can get it for pretty cheap out here, and I eat it a lot. My kid loves it too. So, um, all right. Let's see. Have you tested the two hundred dollar baskets with a paper filter on the bottom? Is it just completely useless? So yes, I did. Um, I did not include it in my video, and it's be, it's for a very simple reason. Um, it does not improve efficiency; it just improves consistency. So the efficiency is already there with those two hundred dollar baskets, so you don't need it. Consistency, it will improve. I found that you still needed a really good putt preparation uh, technique in order to maximize the efficiency of those baskets. You will be able to uh, uh, maximize your consistency using paper filters. But honestly, if you're if you're tied to using paper filters, I wouldn't even recommend getting the two hundred dollar baskets. Just use a Pullman, save yourself some money, and you're almost there anyway. Um, SSP multi-purpose or unimodal for light roasted espresso? That really depends on you, honestly. It depends on what you like in an espresso. Um, let's see. What would you consider worthwhile upgrade from Commandante Hand Grinder for pour over? Well, let's see. There's a lot of great upgrades to the Commandante. I'm not actually a big fan of the flavor. Pro I think it produces a, a, a fair flavor profile. I have never been married to that um, to that grinder. And I actually think uh, the Q2 Easy Presso for 100 bucks rivals the flavor profile. Um, there's some, like, it's hit or miss when I have people blind taste them where they'll pick the Commandante or they'll pick the Q2. Uh, so it's, it's close enough that, like, it's hit or miss when I, when I present this uh, pairing to people. But, um, you know, honestly, uh, it depends on the price you're willing to pay. If you can, I, I genuinely adore the Time War 078. And again, I paid full price for that. Time War asked if I wanted it for free and if I wanted to collaborate with them. And I said, no, I don't like the word collaborate. I'll just buy it. And I ended up buying it. Everyone else was getting those free. I got that. I bought that. And I genuinely love it. And I was very critical of their silly burr in their hand grinder, the chestnut that has like the horizontal and then the vertical. I thought it was just the, an attempt at innovation for the sake of innovation. And when I saw these turbo burrs, I thought it was the same thing, which honestly it probably is. And they, I think they just got lucky. I'm just going to be honest. Because the 078 burrs are fantastic. Now, I can't say the same about the 064. I don't have it yet. And I'm, I'm just not sure if it will give me the same wow uh, factor as the 078 turbos. But that one with on the Kickstarter price, oh, hard to beat. Um, have you gotten a chance? Thank you, Burke. Have you gotten a chance to try uh, to, or to take a look at the new Meticulous Espresso machine? I was thinking about pre-ordering one. Okay. Super exciting news. Tomorrow, if you're seeing this in the future, I'm sorry. But tomorrow, Emily Bryant, Instagram fellow YouTuber, is coming to Porto with a meticulous. Um, so I will get to be playing with it for the next few weeks, and it will arrive tomorrow in the hands of Instagram herself. Um, someone said something that I wanted to respond to. Let's see. Where was it? Uh, 
Do you really hate the Niche Zero? Thank you for asking this. No, I do not. And I tried to be as clear as possible in my video about the Niche Zero that I do not hate the Niche Zero. I don't at all. I just think it is severely overhyped, and I don't think it, it. I don't think it's. I think it's a good $500 conical burr grinder. It's the best $500 conical burr grinder, for sure. There's no question. Is it worth a thousand? It'll probably pull fine. So it gives a lot of people a lot of confidence when they're di dialing in, and it makes them think the grinder is so good. When in reality, they just have this massive margin of error in order to get a really good shot, whereas much other grinders are like this. So I think it's a great kind of a grinder in that regard. I don't hate it though. No. In fact, I'll use it oftentimes if I if I just want to pull an example shot, because I know I can just toss it on 18 or whatever, and boom, I got a nine bar shot. It may not be great, but it works. And so you kind of have a much lower ceiling with the niche, in my opinion. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of that's kind of that. Um, wow, thank you very much, Austin. Um, I appreciate that. Um, and Daniel. Uh, let's see. The whole monologue about niche was cut out. They sabotaged the video. Oh, no. Wow, lame. I, uh, someone asked about the niche versus the J Max. I would, I actually prefer J Max shots. I think they produce much better texture. Um, I, when it comes to tra traditional shots, my number one uh, priority is definitely texture. I want to have that really nice, thick, velvety texture, and I don't want astringency or bitterness. I don't want that uh, unless it's inherent in the bean I'm choosing, obviously. But I want it to pr provide a balanced, rich, thick, syrupy shot. And oftentimes the niche just doesn't provide that. So again, just a, a TLDR, TLDW, whatever on the niche. I do not hate the niche. I think it's overhyped. Hopefully this has uh, saved my um, my thoughts. So when I post it later, you can kind of see that. But anyway, all right. Let's see. You're not allowed to speak bad about the niche. Honestly, the comments on that video I made uh, definitely say that. Thoughts on option O P100 and is it worth getting over DF83 with SSP at 1K? I have an easy J Max and it's nice, but grinding lighter rose is difficult and I hate how the knob keeps popping off. So I do have the P100. I have not done nearly enough with it in order to formulate any type of opinion that could sway you one way or another. So mum is the word for me on the P100. I'm sorry about that. Uh, the DF83 with SSP I think is great. I'm super not stoked on the declumper. There have been great uh, people with modified declumpers that you can buy, I would highly recommend doing that. An issue with the DF83 that people have found is the declumper is so hard that it keeps grounds in the burrs and they, they spin and they create extra fines by grinding too much, uh, like double grinding. So what was your first time tasting specialty coffee like? Um, it's kind of funny. I worked at a traditional coffee shop. We didn't serve co specialty coffee at all. And I was reticent. I did not want to taste specialty coffee. I don't know why, but to me it sounded weird this dark, bitter coffee that my dad loved to drink, the thicker, the better, the muddier, the better, you know, it puts hair on your chest kind of thing. People were saying, oh, this tastes like, you know, these different fruits. And I just, to me, that sounded weird. I didn't want the coffee taste and fruit taste. It sounded gross. And one day I remember a friend was really excited, a guy named Jared, was really excited about a coffee he had. And he's like, you've got to try this. You've got to get into these types of coffee with me. Um, this one tastes like tomato soup. And I was like, gross. I don't want that. Now I know that was definitely a Kenyan coffee, but I, that was so gross. I didn't even want to take a sip. I smelled it and I said, that's not for me, man. Eventually there was a coffee that we brewed um, and we started to serve specialty coffee on bar at this place for a 25 cent uh, upcharge. And we served a naturally processed Ethiopia Guji Hambala from Onyx Coffee Lab with whom I now work. And I remember grinding it to make batch brew and the, it smelled so incredible, like like nothing I'd ever experienced. It smelled like blueberries, okay? And I got really obsessed. And then I started to actually do pour overs with the manager who kept trying to get me to do it for a year. And I kept saying, no, now I'm doing it in his office. He gave me Scott Rayo's books to read and I read them. And I'm now like just so into coffee. And uh, people were asking me when I would serve this coffee to them, how is it tasting like blueberry? And I, I'm not kidding you. I knew nothing about coffee. I worked here and it was, like I said, it was a traditional shop. We used commodity grade coffee. It was awful. I did it to, to make ends meet uh, while I was in grad school. And I told people, no joke, I said, you know how they use chicory in Louisiana to make chicory roasted coffee? They put chicory in the roaster. They do the same with this. They put blueberries in the roaster. I literally said that. How embarrassing, right? Um, and it's because it just didn't make sense to me that this bean, which I still thought it was a bean, uh, could ha taste like that. So I, I don't like not knowing something. So I just straight up made that up. And I was approached by my good friend, Zach Kelly, who was the manager and now lives in Italy. And I get to see him sometimes now, which is great. But he approached me um, in the back one day and said, hey, have you been telling people that th this coffee is roasted with blueberries? And I said, what? 
that? No, I did not say that. Straight up lied to his face. And he said, yeah, there are people saying that. You've said that. I was like, no, no. And he said, because you know, it's just, it's like coffee is from a cherry and it's just the it's just the, or, or the the characteristics of this specific coffee with how it was processed. I said, yeah, I know that. That's what I've been telling people. I was so embarrassed. I felt like such an ignoramus. Um, anyway, uh, yes, so that was my first. Um, let's see. Is the audio still being weird? I'm so sorry. Oh, my Lanta. Uh, London Coffee Festival? No. Yeah, so people are saying exit and rejoin to fix the audio. I'm so sorry about this. Uh, this is what happens when Ugo's gone. My sweet, darling Ugo, my cameraman, my, my, my rock, my shelter, my wings. Um, apologies for that. Come to Portland. We'll hang out. I wish I could. I won't be able to travel, sadly. Um, let's see. And let's say the last year or so, what is your favorite espresso machine you've used? Ooh, good question. Good question. The last year or so, the fav my favorite espresso machine. Vintage-wise, I'm going with the... Uh, I've well, I've really been enjoying my 1973 Cremina. It has been a pleasure to use, especially since I've outfitted it with a Thermoprobe. Uh, but if we're going with, with like modern machines, in the last year, modern machine... I really enjoy using the Lilith Bianca. I, I the paddle's kind of fun. Um, oh no, the, the my favorite machine to use last year was the Lance Hedrick Breville Dual Boiler, baby. Come on now, that was obviously the best. Um, I really enjoyed using that. Um, Ugo is the glue. Ugo for sure. D wet WDT for blooming pour overs. So this is something that I um, need to say. It's prideful though. Wet WDT. I started that. Well, I don't know if I actually started. I'm sure other people did independently. But I posted about that in like December of 21 or 2020, 21, 20, 20. I can't remember. But there's a video on percolative immersion where I show wet WDT as a, an ideal way to kind of saturate the grounds without stirring and without swirling. Um, it was a much more effective way of using those thin needles to kind of break up clumps and to ensure homogeneity in the coffee puck or the coffee bed. Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan. <gasps> Whoop, hiccups. I'm a big fan of wet WDT. I don't do it in conical uh, brewers because I'm scared of piercing the filter, but if it's flat bottom at all, I'm, I'm definitely doing the dubs. Um, why are espresso machines so expensive? Are they getting cheaper? Yes, they're a lot getting a lot cheaper. Absolutely. If you want to start with a really cheap one, do with like the Flare Neo, 100 bucks or so. Uh, I just want ACS Vostok. You and me both. I want to keep one. It's awesome. Is the decent worth it for a first espresso machine or something like the Argos Odyssey Espresso? So I can't speak about the Argos because I don't have one yet. I will be getting one, but I just, I don't have one. Uh, the decent for a starter, I probably would not recommend. Uh, that's a hard one to recommend as a starter. It's really intense and I would, I would be fearful of someone just getting overwhelmed with it. Um, though you can use it, you know, with one profile, but it's hard to want to just stick with one when you have, when the world's at your fingertips. You know what I mean? Um, are you still wearing the whoop? Took it off for the video. Um, all the cities you've traveled to, what city had the best overall coffee culture? I traveled to Vancouver once a year just for the coffee scene. Los Angeles. Oh, well, you said culture. Culture, the best coffee culture. Um, there's a lot of drama in the Los Angeles coffee scene, I'll just be honest with you. there, But it's the best coffee city. I mean, which makes sense because how big it is. But yeah, the coffee culture there, it, you know, it's fine. But the, the the amount of coffee shops you have there is mind blowing. It's it is the coffee city I've ever been to, and I've been all throughout you know Europe and Australia, and um, I've not yet been to Eastern Asia for the coffee scene there. Uh, I'm assuming it's absolutely mind boggling from what I've seen. I'm hoping to go to Tokyo maybe later this year. We'll see. But um, yeah, um, the 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 best coffee culture. You know, I'm most versed in U.S. coffee shops. I've been to probably thousands at this point throughout the U.S. Um, you know, New York has a really solid coffee culture. They have this whole mentality of New York versus the world, which, you know, it, you can, it can either annoy you or you can, you know, you can appreciate it. And I kind of appreciate it. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you have baristas there that just go and hang out at all the shops all the time. It's pretty cool, pretty cool coffee culture there. Um, let's see. Japanese and Hong Kong coffee scenes are amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. I want to go to Hong Kong as well really badly. We work with, I work with a coffee shop there called Black Sugar. Uh, they serve Onyx as their espresso. Um, all right. Let's see. I do like LA. Yeah, say more about LA. It's great. Um, 
What's the best workflow grinder for someone who drinks one coffee at a time and maximize value? It depends on your budget and how you drink your coffee, what style of coffee you like. There's a lot of questions that need answering there. Do you have any thoughts on specialty cold brew? There doesn't seem to be a lot of specialty coffee YouTubers who make videos on it. I personally don't like cold brew and it's hard for me to want to make a video on something I don't enjoy. I, I addressed this earlier. When I don't like a machine, I normally don't, I just won't review it unless it has a lot of hype or if they're lying or dishonest in their marketing. So it's same with like cold brew. I don't really like cold brew. Um, it, it just doesn't taste good to me. It tastes like you filtered it in a sock or something. It's, it's kind of, and it's nothing again. If you like cold brew, drink it. Just make sure you're buying from roasters where you know where the money's going. That's my only thing. You drink coffee however you want. Just be conscious, be a conscious uh, consumer. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to take a couple more and then I'm going to log off. I didn't realize it's been an hour 15. Wow. Thank you so much. Are you still using your Bentwood or has your EG1 taken over basically everything? I don't use anything daily. And it's because I'm constantly using all these grinders I have to make good uh, informed reviews. So my Bentwood has been on the shelf for a while and it's because um, I've done that review and I will definitely come back to it and I, l I, I miss it. But it's, it, it, I, in order to give you a nice thorough review like I enjoy doing, I like to spend months on grinders, especially if they're expensive. So with the EG1, I spent like nine months on it. Cause it's like one of the most expensive grinders. With the P100, I'll probably spend like three months on that. The bent what I spent like three months on. Uh, the cheaper the grinder goes, the less time I kind of spend on it. And it's only because when someone is making such a financial commitment on a grinder, I want to make sure I have a really good feeling for it. It's not that I don't want to have a really good feeling for a $199 grinder, but I think a month is sufficient for those, except for you know longevity of the product if it's a new product to the market which I, I tend to kind of just be like, you know, this is new. We don't really know. There's no proven customer support, et cetera. So no, it's not that the EG1 has taken it over. I do prefer espresso, I think, from the core burrs on the EG1 to the Bentwood, though, to be honest. It's close, though. It's close. The bent, You know, I can't say that. I've not done side-by-sides. I've been, I, I've, I've had the core more recently. Uh, I think that's why I said that. Let's see. Um, have you tested the R2 extract refractometer? Yes, and it does an absolutely fantastic job. At the price, there's no point not getting it if you're wanting uh, a, a refractometer. I still use my VST mostly just because it is much more robust, um, and it's just I have a workflow with it that it's just I just am used to it. Uh, but the R2 does a great, a great job. R1, not so much. Um, all right. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and... Uh, Will I ever grow a beard? I would if I could, but I can't. It's one of those things. I have bald patches here. I wish I could. I grow what I can, which is the stash. But um, prefer 83HU or 64MP. Personally, 64MP. Uh, recommendations for reputable books on coffee chemistry, green coffee, roasting, extraction water. Um, uh, I, I did like a, um, a, an Instagram reel on this. There's a big textbook. It's not cheap. It's like 200 bucks um, called Coffee. Let me see what it's called real quick. Coffee Production, Quality, and Chemistry. Uh, that is uh, the, the most robust writing um, uh, by doctorates, etc., on on the chemistry of coffee that I know. Uh, and also follow Samo Smirke. I highly recommend following him. Okay, uh, Gaj is still kicking. Yeah, I'm about to start the Gajuino. I need some 3D printed things. Um, all right. Sorry, I'll do one more question because I love this question. I like when people give me a big budget and ask to set up a, a system. If you were to spend 4000 on an espresso setup, how would the split between machine versus grinder be? Uh, at $4,000, this might shock some of you, um, but I personally, $4,000, I'm getting, I think I can afford a Breville dual boiler and a P100. I might go over budget just a little bit. But that's the most expensive grinder I can get at 98 millimeters. I, I, I don't have full thoughts on this. This is me assuming it's as good as everyone says um, and the Breville dual boiler. Or if you're, you know, you're weird about uh, Breville dual boilers, I love it. I would, I would mod it and it'd be incredible. If you're weird about those, then I would up the budget of espresso. I would go down and get a Zerno at about $1,300. And for $2,700, I'd get a Bianca, a Lelite Bianca, I think. I think that's right at twenty six, twenty seven hundred dollars. So those would be my two, the two areas, depending on the direction you want to go. The Zerno, I will be honest, I've used it for a while and I'm absolutely loving it. But um, wow, thank you, Matt. Thank you so much for the for the, the little tip there. But yeah, so that, that that's a fun one. Will we see a Lance Hedrick Kyle Rosell collab? I told him if he flies to Porto, baby, we'll collab it up. You know what I mean? Um, cool. All right, I think. We're going to call it a day. Thank you so much for everyone who came through and chatted. I will be uploading this live um, so that, you know, if you're if you're crazy and want to go back and watch it, um, I may try to go through and, and put time cues, but um, 
Anyway, I really, really appreciate it. This was my first live ever, and y'all have been just so gracious with the issues we've had because I'm not a camera person. I uh, hope you enjoyed the new studio. Thanks for two years of incredible uh, community and, and and just you know making my life so much better. Um, I really do appreciate it, and I uh, hope to continue making just fantastic content for you all that you appreciate. Um, but yes, thank you so much, and cheers. Brew something tasty. Okay.